Now to the latest on the seemingly two-minute account investigations focusing on our president. As we told you just yesterday, the real worries for the president appear to have shifted from Robert Mueller and his pending report to Congressman Jerry Nadler and the mounting Democratic congressional investigations. And don't forget about the Southern District. Nadler, he's heading close to home for the president, requesting documents and information from 81 different people and entities yesterday, including both Trump and Sons, Plus, Jared Kushner, the Trump Organization, Campaign, Transition, Inaugural Committee, plus the National Enquirer, the Americans at the Trump Tower meeting, and, well, frankly, too many more to count. Now, the takeaway, as Michelle Cottle put in the Times editorial today, the next several months will be a nonstop brace yourself. Then, there are the new reports that in 2017, Trump ordered Gary Cohn, who was the head of the Council of Economic Advisors, to block AT&T's merger with Time Warner, in part because Time Warner owns CNN and, as you know, Trump hates CNN. Also, to help Trump's pal Rupert Murdoch at Fox News, it was an extraneous benefit. Now, the exchange with Cohn and Chief of Staff John Kelly, as reported by The New Yorker's Jane Meyer, I've been telling Cohn to get this lawsuit filed and nothing's happened. I've mentioned it 50 times and nothing's happened. I want to make sure it's filed. I want the deal blocked. Now that prompted George Conway, you might remember him, he's the husband of Kelly Ann Conway, um, to tweet the following. If proven, such an attempt to use presidential authority to seek retribution for the exercise of First Amendment rights would unquestionably be grounds for impeachment. And he's not the only one who feels that way. Compare that merger story to this one. Cell phone carrier T-Mobile admitting today it spent nearly 200 grand at Trump's D.C. hotel since announcing its plans to merge with Sprint, a deal set to be finalized in the next few months. Now, for insight, let's bring in Andrew Tchaikovsky. He a defense attorney and a former federal prosecutor. <laughs> Where to begin here, Andrew? But first, let's start off uh, with the House Judiciary Committee. Um, and before I get to the names and uh, and also a name that's not necessarily someone they want documents going to run it. A more broad question. When you look at this, do you look at this as a political exercise that's gotcha or that this is something that is two years past due and they're making up for lost time? What is the role of Congress, given what we know and don't know, and do you think the list of 81 is appropriate? Well, I think that as long as President Trump is in office and the Democrats are in control in Congress, there's going to be investigations. Now, whether that's justified or not really depends on what they're uncovering. As we stand right now, especially after the testimony of Michael Cohn last week and a lot of what has come out of the Mueller investigation with regard to those indictments and even those convictions, we see at least some evidence that there may be some form of, of obstruction of justice or some sort of, of perjury type uh, information coming from President Trump. That needs to be investigated. Whether that has occurred or not, I think it is fair for that to be investigated. Now, if this goes on for years, I think we see that as far more political than something that is uh, for good purpose. Uh, we'll get into some of the names in a second, but a new name that surfaced today was basically uh, the lead prosecutor, if you will, that's been appointed to this. He's a good friend and a good friend to the program, uh, Dan Goldman. Um, I guess I'm not going to be having him as a guest often anymore, but uh, Jerry Nadler appointed him. Now, what's notable to me is not only did he come from the Southern District, but he also had an expertise as it was in prosecuting mob bosses, particularly Russian mob bosses. What does that tell you as to possibly where this committee might be going? Well, any sort of uh, investigation with the types of, of angles that we have here, the size of it, the Trump organization, the way that Michael Cohn suggested that Trump gives, it gives direction kind of through suggestion, that's all very mafia type behavior. And so you might have uh, a prosecutor who's had experience in that area more uh, able to look into that type of of case more aptly. So it tells me that the uh, that Congress and specifically the Judiciary Committee is looking into whether there is that sort of mafia-esque type of behavior going on in the Trump organization. And also experience uh, with some of these Russian mob figures as to whether or not also money traded hands when you're starting from the oligarchs all the way down. But one of the names that jumped out to me, um, and not that it was unexpected, but Alan Weisselberg. CFO, Trump organizations, as anybody knows of for more than 40 years of the company where the checks were written and where the bodies are buried, it would be him. 
But help me out, Andrew. He's obviously um, been a cooperating witness with Mueller. Um, who knows what, if anything, he may have been doing with the Southern District. How do they make sure they don't cross um, lanes here at all and they don't jeopardize or even pollute the other's investigations? Uh, is this coordinated with all parties involved? Could the House Judiciary be going on their own? How does this work? Well, of the 81 people that these requests for documents were sent to, I think the most interesting are those in the inner circle of the Trump organization. Mr. Weisselberg, as well as the Trump family, um, and uh, Mr. Kushner, getting that information is really the uh, one of the pieces of the puzzle that we as the public have yet to see. What's going on on the inside? Now, what's uh, interesting about kind of as we go forward, how that, that develops and how it we get into the information, whether it steps over the uh, investigations that are going on in other places, that's really irrelevant. Congress can get into things that the Department of Justice is looking into and vice versa. So it's not like they have particularly well-defined lanes. Mueller and the Southern District of New York, they're trying to stay in, uh, stay out of each other's lanes, but Congress really can do what they choose to do. To that end, uh, there was an exchange um, in the one uh, day of public testimony uh, from Mr. Cohen. Um, and of all people, um, it came from Congresswoman uh, Cortez. Uh, she asked a question, and a lot of people think it opened up a door potentially. Let me play the clip. I want to ask a little bit about uh, your conversation with my colleague from Missouri about asset inflation. Um, to your knowledge, did the president ever provide inflated assets to an insurance company? Yes. Who else knows that the president did this? Alan Weisselberg, Ron Liebman, and Matthew Calamari. And where would the committee find more information on this? Do you think we need to review his financial statements and his tax returns in order to compare them? Yes, and you'd find it at the Trump Org. To that point, Andrew, today, New York State is subpoenaing, in effect, the insurance records, and they're going after the insurance broker particularly for that data. Um, this one, at least on its face, seems like this is right for potential problems for the president. Oh, absolutely. Any statements that are made by the president that are untrue in an official capacity are going to be a problem for him. Now, this is probably along the lines of what the president and his legal camp will call process type crimes. But it's it, almost exactly the type of thing that uh, Mr. Cohn has uh, gone down for and that he's been prosecuted for and that he'll be going to jail for. So anything that uh, is this idea of filling out official documentation, whether it's tax documents or bank documents, if there's lies in those, that's a real problem and something that definitely could be the source of impeachment. Now, Mr. Cohn needs to be corroborated in everything that he says because he's got some real credibility issues. But if that turns out to be true, that's a real issue. You know, just as a consumer of this, and I have to spend hours of my life, and you've forgotten more than I know as it relates to the law, but it would seem to me that if the Mueller probe really focused on the Russia question, what kind of coordination there was or whether it was not, um, they focused on that angle. The Southern District uh, got into a lot of, on the finances, we know that Weisselberg um, could shed a tremendous potential amount of light. And whether or not uh, Trump in his private life, whether it be the foundation, the organization, and everything in between, um, basically committed a whole lot of crimes. And Congress then got into basically interfering with the rule of law. It would seem that there is a way that each could have their own identity, but it seems that there's an inevitability here, Andrew, that they're going to cross over and that the we, the people, when trying to consume so much of this, it almost is going to be too much. Well, it's a constitutional issue at the end of the day. The question of whether the president who allegedly committed crimes, and at this point, we're not even sure what those allegations specifically are, whether he committed those crimes ultimately is likely only an avenue to be dealt with through impeachment. There's been a lot of discussion. Can Mueller indict? Can the Southern District indict? And the truth is that there is a long held uh, memorandum and opinion that is well justified that there is no indictment. Now, perhaps if President Trump 
got into office through through illegal activity, there would be a better case to be made for indictment. But here, whatever comes from the Mueller investigation, whatever co comes from the Southern District of New York, likely that will be funneled to Congress, who will look at it, examine it, and determine if that supports a case for, uh, for impeachment. That's really what we have at the end of the day. And in a perverse way, Andrew, one of the worst things that could happen to the president is if he lost re-election, not for just the traditional reasons that he lost the office of the presidency, but come 2020, he could be looking potentially, and I'm saying potentially, obviously, at some criminal exposure in the Southern District in New York. And there's no pardon powers for that. That's right. Um, he does have a motivation to win re-election for many reasons. One of them could be to avoid the idea of indictment. Now, I think that if there are charges that are so significant that would lead to a criminal indictment of a former president, that it would also likely be something that would lead to impeachment, especially given that we've got a Congress of the opposing uh, party. So I, I don't think that the fact that he gets reelected or not is going to excuse him from misconduct and illegal activity that is uncovered, but it could have the, uh, the effect of keeping him from being indicted. And if people are doing the calendars and the clocks in their head a little bit, do you imagine the kind of conversations we're going to be having in all likelihood in the middle of a national presidential election season, potentially on Capitol? Andrew, as always, uh, you're great. I appreciate a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. All right, coming up next, maybe he thought that there was already one too many billionaires in the race for 2020. But either way, Michael Bloomberg, he's out of the Oval Office sweet space. Our panel will join us next to discuss that and more.